crunch so good to be back again it's been a while since we sit here again the past product crunches were virtually um, they were also hosted by Maya so people who have been part of product crunch for a while uh, maybe remember uh, back in the days when I got the pleasure to to host everybody here um, but yeah before we start let me say a couple of things um, first of all if you've never joined the product crunch um, event um, yeah, I want to give you a little bit of an intro on what we do here. So um, Product Crunch is a community that we started a couple of years back um, to really give back to the design and product community, mostly here in Berlin, but we also then had it in Munich and in Paris um, just to bring uh, designers, product people, project managers, and everybody interested in the topics together. And um, yeah, to really also not just talk about our companies, but really the things we do every day, the things that challenge us, the things we learned. Um, we had really interesting talks about, yeah, all the tough things that happened, but also all the really beautiful and unexpected um, things. And every product crunch has um, a topic. So from sex tech to uh, the game edition, we have we covered a lot of things. Um, today is. In addition, I'm really, really um, yeah, happy about, and I was, I've been waiting for, 
for this for quite a while. Yes, it's the editorial edition, and um, yeah, it's a special edition for us uh, for for Good Patch. Um, Good Patch is the design agency I work for, and some others here work for as well. And we build mostly digital products. So we build apps, software, um, all the other things that are kind of connected digital. Uh, we want to build products that people really love, um, so that's why we do a lot of interviews and so on. Um, but I think for us, everybody being a designer at heart, we all are very, very passionate about all the magazines. I mean, here, I don't know if you can see, there's so many magazines here, and we didn't just buy them for today, they're actually in the office all the time, and they're read, and we, we check them out and talk about them. So, yeah, it's a very special edition for us because it's not so digital, not so digital uh, like all the other work we normally do. Um, but I'm very, very happy to be joined by a really uh, interesting group here. And, yeah, I don't even want to say too much about yourselves, but uh, maybe we can go uh, make the round and you quickly introduce yourselves, your name and what you do here. Hi, uh, I'm Dominic and I work at Neue Native as an art director. Hi, I'm Lisa and I work at Der Freitag, the weekly newspaper, for those of you who don't know. And uh, yes, I've been there, I think, for five years now, yeah, about that time. And, yes, this mm -hmm. and I'm working as the title and designer for Der Freitag. Um, I'm working there since two years and I'm the title designer since two years. Hi everyone, I'm Monica. I'm a design strategist at Good Patch with Sam, Alex and Felix and help organize product crunch and today I'm going to be moderating the chat. So if you have any questions, ask them um, to the computer and I'll throw them into the round if they're good enough to be asked. Yeah, we have, um, that's the people that are here in this room. It's a special setup. We call it kind of a workshop discussion so that we can really um, engage with each other. Each other. You also have two um, visitors or <laughs> a, a small audience, but we have to keep the numbers down a bit because of the situation you all know. Um, but also, in addition to the people here in the room, we have someone all the way in uh, New York. So uh, Sophie is, he is. Yeah, you probably see yeah, her. You probably right see, now. Her right see her right now. now. I see her on the screen. And um, she's also going to kick off tonight with a. Uh, with a nice um, talk yeah, about her work uh, at The New Yorker. And I'm actually, I just assume that you live in New York because you work for The New Yorker, but uh, is, it, is this correct? This is correct. New York. I, New York. Yes. Okay. I, I live in Brooklyn, New York, so not Manhattan, but close. Perfect, even better. Yeah, so I'm yeah, um, so, gonna take it over from here. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. We're really, really excited to hear what you have. Yes, to hear what yes. you have. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so I will go ahead and hopefully grapple with technology and share my screen and present. So I'm assuming this is all all right and, and you'll holler if, if I have any technical difficulties. Um, but as mentioned, my name is Sophie Taran and I am the senior UX writer for The New Yorker. I am based in Brooklyn, New York, uh, which is where I'm calling in from today. Um, and I am going to spend a few minutes talking about what product design looks like uh, at The New Yorker. And of course, we are um, owned by Condé Nast, which is a larger media company. But I'd like to really dig into how we specifically are taking this very well-established voice, something that has existed for almost 100 years, and uh, actually originated in long form print magazines, almost the opposite of a digital space, um, and how we are adapting that to a digital space. So uh, just in case you aren't as familiar with The New Yorker, um, it was established in 1925 as a very Manhattan-centric magazine. Um, it still does publish uh, a weekly print magazine, um, but uh, we also have added dozens of daily articles uh, that are web exclusives as well to cover more daily current events. Um, and The New Yorker's reporting is generally known for being very in-depth. It's very long form. We do a lot of political and cultural coverage, of course, uh, fiction, commentary, crosswords, poetry, um, cartoons, and of course, humor. 
but recently, as I mentioned, we have expanded into more di digital spaces. So about 20 years ago, we launched NewYorker.com, which is um, where we do publish those web exclusive pieces. Uh, we also have a couple of apps. Our primary app is the New Yorker app, and that's where you can find every single thing that's available in the magazine, as well as everything on the web. You can play crosswords, you can swipe through cartoons, you can listen to audio versions of narrated articles and podcasts. Um, a whole lot uh, is available just through our app. Um, and at Condé Nast as a whole. Uh, and so I have a lot of work to do to basically establish this practice and take this voice that people really know and respect and love um, and translate that into a digital space. And really, I like to summarize my role as being to basically take this voice and, and figure out how it can sound on something like a screen or an interface, um, hopefully without sounding like Steve Buscemi trying to hang with the cool kids. Um, but a lot of this work is uh, basically asking how we can uh, collaborate closely with the work that the editorial team has done. Um, and a lot of this is, uh, it really takes a village. It's not something that I alone am answering. I'm not creating a, a digital voice from scratch. Um, it really is a matter of kind of adapting and translating and working very closely with the hard work that the editorial team has done over the course of the past few decades. So really this question really boils down to something like this. How do I, as a UX writer, collaborate with the editorial team, the people who are behind the magazine itself, the people who are writing the articles and editing them and art directing and providing photography, um, all of the people behind the scenes who create what The New Yorker is and, and what people know it to be. Uh, and so this uh, question really boils down to the word collaboration. And if you're familiar with UX writing in general, um, collaboration is a very central aspect of the role. Uh, I am constantly collaborating with, of course, the designer as my closest uh, kind of partner in the world of UX writing. Um, but really, uh, it looks like this, where we have kind of a set of figure eights, where we're constantly syncing, we're constantly working closely with one another. Um, we align on things like what is the approach that we're going to take to this or what platform are we going to use are we starting in figma or google docs or with just pencil and paper so we think we make these decisions and then there are these arcs of independent work in between, um, but constantly touching base, constantly checking in with one another. And then as time goes on, the figure eight starts to look more like a braid because we're kind of bringing in, weaving in more collaborators, more people that we work alongside. And this takes the shape of uh, really everyone. Um, we work with researchers to make sure that our designs and our copy are as intuitive as we think they are. Uh, we work with, with the support team to see what questions we can proactively answer and uh, make sure that the end result is not uh, causing an, an influx of questions from our readers. Um, we work with marketing to make sure that the words that I choose to put into the app or the website uh, are actually words that marketing can use in their communications as well. So there is this nice consistent flow and, and voice throughout all of our different touch points and on and on and on. So we work with all of these different people. It is a very collaborative effort and it, it really does look more like this, this kind of woven process, this braid. Uh, at most other companies, at, in most other industries, this is it. This is the team. These are all of the disciplines that are represented. Um, but in media, uh, you have the editorial team. That, that's really the core of what you're working with, the core of the voice that you're working with, especially as a UX writer like myself. Um, and in that case, the team really needs to form the, the constant thread throughout this braid. Um, the braid would completely fall apart without their close collaboration, their close insight every single step of the way. Um, because really, you know, we're, I'm just kind of carrying a baton uh, for a voice that has been established over a very long time and will hopefully continue on um, far beyond my time as well. Uh, so this is this is really what it looks down to, what it boils down to, a lot of close collaboration. Um, and so I'd like to take a look at what this looks like in practice and, and in real life and some of the uh, features that we have um, put out into the world recently so we can see how this collaboration plays out. 
Um, one recent initiative that we have been uh, continuing to add to over the course of this year is the future of democracy. Uh, so in the United States, it is, of course, an election year on top of everything else that's going on right now. Um, and so the editorial team decided to put together a series of articles that speak to what democracy in America looks like today and where it comes from, what it could look like in the future. Of course, from the editorial point of view, they're working on the articles themselves. They're working with the writers, they're editing them, they're pulling together art. Where we come into play is working closely with that editorial team to craft basically everything you see highlighted in red here. So we have a tagline that lives in a banner at the top of the website to draw readers to this new initiative. Um, we have a newsletter sign up so that if they want to continue following this initiative, they can do so easily. Um, account management, recirculation so that they can find more related articles. Basically everything that helps make it easy uh, and as usable as possible so that our readers can find this content and this information um, very seamlessly. A few more examples, um, frequently asked questions, not the most uh, appealing um, kind of topic for a lot of people, but this was a project that uh, ended up being highly collaborative. Um, you'll see the uh, first version, the initial version on the left, that's what our frequently asked questions page used to look like. We had, I think, 10 different sections that you choose from to, to try and find an answer, all written in all caps, not the easiest to navigate. Um, this is something that uh, really spanned almost every single discipline that we work with. We worked with research and support to identify what exactly people were asking and what they were looking for, and then user tested our new sections to make sure that people could actually find the answers that they were looking for. Um, we worked, of course, very closely with our designers to make sure that we're adding in a little bit more white space than before um, and making it a little bit more visually appealing. Uh, and then my favorite part was that we collaborated with the editorial team's art director to commission a set of custom illustrations um, by the illustrator Greg Clark. So uh, we had this kind of idea of, of you know, a dog venturing around the city, um, and we just made sure that uh, he was carrying either a magazine or a tablet, no matter where he went, um, to uh, correspond nicely to our frequently asked questions. So that even if you are just uh, trying to find an answer to a question about your subscription, it still feels like the New Yorker, and there is still a little bit of delight there. Um, a very recent initiative or feature that we just launched is audio in our app. So you can now listen to podcasts as well as uh, narrated versions of a lot of our articles directly from the app. Um, and so this, of course, started in the interface. Uh, what are the CTAs here? Is it play, story, listen, begin? Once we aligned on that, and of course the uh, product design or the, the design of the actual feature, um, this uh, spiraled into a number of different touch points across all of the New Yorker. So we of course have the app and the interface here that we're looking at. Um, and in addition to the app, I was also able to write an editorial post that appeared on newyorker.com to announce this new offering. Um, so this was done in very close collaboration with the editors and the copy editing team to make sure that, of course, the writing itself is closely aligned with what you would see across any other article on the website or in the magazine. Um, we worked closely with our designers to create these wonderful screenshots. And then I was also able to work with our art department, uh, the editors, and our product manager to create a house ad that actually appeared in the print magazine as well. So all of these different touch points, all to talk about what we're doing on the product side and make sure that um, people are, are really able to find out and hear about this and use this uh, new feature wherever they are. Um, the last uh, recent uh, product that we worked on was um, this incredible undertaking on the editorial team's part where they created this uh, interactive piece that highlighted every single one of the 24 hours that made up April 15th, 2020, which um, medical experts cited as really the peak of the coronavirus pandemic in New York City. Um, I'm hoping that that was the one peak here. Uh, and so we wanted to, the editorial side wanted to capture what exactly that looked like every single hour of the day in New York City. Um, a massive undertaking, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of people were involved. 
Uh, my very small contribution as a UX writer was to write this blurb that encouraged people to consider a subscription um, if they did enjoy this sort of journalism. Um, and this is one of my favorite examples, uh, you know, despite how small it is, because it's one of the few places that we speak to how much is churning under the surface, how many people, how much work, how much collaboration it takes to make something like this possible. Um, in addition to the nearly 50 writers and photographers that contributed to the piece, of course, there are the product designers, the UX writers, uh, the product managers, the editors, the copy editors. Um, it, it really, truly takes a village to make something like this possible. And so this is all to say that it, it does take constant close collaboration, this constant weaving of this braid in order to make sure that every single choice that we're making, every single decision, every single character on a page, every pixel on a screen, looks, feels, and sounds like The New Yorker, um, especially staying true to some of our more unique house style decisions, like spelling the word insure with an I. So uh, there's a lot of talk about collaboration, following the rules, following the guidelines, sticking together. Um, I would also like to speak to the flip side of the coin, which is when we decide to break the rules. Uh, and so in the product design industry, and also more recently in the UX writing industry, um, there have been a lot of uh, books, conversations, conferences, you know, case in point, this talk right now, um, about best practices, how we get things done, and, and what you should do, the rules that you should follow. Uh, but what we find, especially working on the editorial side, where you're not creating a digital voice from scratch, you are kind of carrying the baton of an existing voice and introducing it to a new environment, on, in a digital space or on a screen. Um, the question is not so much whether you know the, those best practices and follow them. Uh, it's more so that you know which of those digital best practices are right for you. Um, and so we ask, ask a lot of questions. We really have to turn off autopilot. We can't just blindly follow best practices because uh, you know something that may be a digital best practice is sometimes something that we would never uh, insert into our website or our print magazine. Um, and one example, one of my favorite examples is uh, recently I was working on just a confirmation button on a modal, uh, you know, something that popped up in the app. I think we were telling the user that, you know, a, a magazine issue had downloaded successfully or something, and they just needed to confirm that. Um, it's uh, really a no-brainer. In many other situations, the copy that you would write would say something like, got it, or maybe okay. Um, but we found that uh, for The New Yorker, our voice would never say something as kind of casual or flippant as got it. Um, and so we kind of stopped in our tracks and we were wondering, you know, how, how, do we, how do we handle this situation? How do we make this sound like us? And so we went from something that you see on the left, this blue button, got it, exclamation point, um, to something that kind of skirts the best practices a little bit. It's more verbose. It's a little bit lengthier, something like noted, thank you, um, or adding in periods between each letter of OK, because, again, that's consistent with our house style guide. It's these sorts of decisions that we're making every day that help uh, and, and really add up to make sure that we are sounding like ourselves. Um, we find ourselves doing things like continuing to capitalize the word internet or hyphenate the word offline or add in spot illustrations when you might not expect them. Um, it's really sprinkling these sorts of touches, these you know hundreds, countless different touch points uh, throughout the digital experience that allow us to continue sounding like ourselves. So it really is through this constant close collaboration with the editorial team, uh, the weaving of this uh, kind of braid across all of our different disciplines. Um, and yes, uh, a lot of the time breaking those digital best practices that we're able to remind our users that really no matter where they're reading us, whether it's in the print magazine, through the app, or through really any digital screen, every platform, every single different touch point, um, it really still is the New Yorker behind the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Clap, I don't know. <laughs> <That's fun. laughs> Thanks so much, Sophie. Um, yeah. Over at, at Monica, if, if there have there been any questions. Yeah, we've there. got our first question from Design Dad. He <laughs> says, I wonder, does the New Yorker have a big international following? And what do you think about this? Has there ever been the idea to do something like the New Yorker for, let's say, the Berliner? Uh, 
does does the New Yorker have an international audience? It does. Um, and actually one of the uh, products that, or, or one of the projects that we've been talking about is how we can make it easier for people uh, to subscribe in, in international currencies. So we are thinking about those international audiences. Um, but one thing that has stayed consistent throughout our time is uh, ensuring that you know the New Yorker does it, it does really stick to stick to who it is um, in a lot of senses. It, it still is very Manhattan centric. It still is very New York centric, um, and I don't see that changing. But I do see us continuing to find ways to make it easier and more enjoyable to read and subscribe, um, no matter where you're based. Maybe you guys also have questions. I mean. Uh, I'm one of the international subscribers to the New Yorker, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, if not, money. I have a little question here um, from Lou Says Wow. Hi, I'm currently learning to code for Alexa voice interfaces. Seeing your presentation, I wonder what your opinion is regarding the use of voice interface for news content. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, it's, it was a little hard to hear. Yeah. What, is, what is your opinion? Interface for news content. Content. So that would be something like having your Alexa read read off the news to you, something like that. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, especially with UX writing, writing for bots, you know, writing for chat interfaces, writing for voice is um, a new and, and flourishing part of the industry and, and part of the role. Um, you know, I. I think as time goes on, we're going to continue moving past this idea where a digital experience is tied to a screen, um, it's, and it's going to continue moving into these fields where you know it's it's voice, it's someone talking to you, or uh, maybe you're not interacting with a screen. Maybe you know we'll go full Minority Report, and and you know you're moving things around with your hands alone. Um, so I think there are a lot of different technologies out there. There are a lot of uh, different spaces that we'll be moving into um, that will that will definitely go beyond the screen. And in the end, I think that makes uh, the ability to write UX copy, um, you know, despite despite the kind of environment, even more important. Um, I think voice will be a huge part of that. Yeah, thanks so much. Question. You have one. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Do you personally prefer to read print magazines or online magazines? And you have to be honest. I prefer print or or digital. Um, so I I do receive both. Uh, I I kind of my. Uh, routine is when I receive the print magazine, you know, I do like to flip through it because I like the kind of tangible feel of looking through the magazine, seeing how it's structured, you know, looking through the table of contents, seeing uh, which which writers we have, um, you know, in the magazine that week. Uh, but where digital comes into play is, you know, sometimes I get my magazine on a Tuesday or Wednesday and the new issue comes out first thing Monday morning. So I am able to open up my app and read through um, the latest articles that way. And there's also a lot of uh, content or a lot of pieces that aren't in the print magazine at this point. So um, I do find myself, you know, reading through the app or on the website or listening to a narrated article uh, to make sure that I'm, I'm getting kind of the full breadth of, of what we do offer. And I find it so fascinating when you said, like, yeah, the New Yorker is almost 100 years old. You, your profession there is a year old. How was that? How, how did, were they like, finally a UX writer? That's what we needed. Or, or were they like, uh, were they, like uh, did they think you were a journalist? Think you were a journalist? How, did, how, was, how, how, did, how was that when you started? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's it is kind of a funny situation to be in where the the voice that you're writing for is older than the internet itself, um, and my role is is very based in digital spaces and in the internet. Um, and I think what was really eye opening for me, uh, you know, in addition to just the fact that a lot of UX writing is not writing, it's um, you know, it's it's explaining, it's advocating, it's listening. Uh, you know, there there are all of these other pieces, and and I also do have to do a lot of explaining of of what exactly UX writing is as well. Um, but what was really eye-opening for me was the fact that it's there's such a history behind it. Um, you know, I, I'm 
I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants. I, you know, I'm, I'm just passing this baton. I'm just one person uh, in this very long history of people who have made this publication and this voice what it is. Um, and so there is a very real sense of responsibility to do it justice and to, um, you know, leave it better than I found it uh, and not make it something that it's not. Um, versus, you know, some of my previous roles um, that were at, you know, much younger startups or tech companies where, um, you know, you're you're creating a lot of things from scratch. Uh, so really a different feel, um, but uh, it, it is really, really incredible to see, you know, how, how much history there is to it. Um, when I started, I, you know, I thought I, I knew about the publication, but there are, you know, dozens of books out there about the history of The New Yorker. Um, so I had, I had some catching up to do. Is there anything that really surprised you after you started? Um... um really surprised me. Uh, I mean, I was, I was pretty excited about the fact that I, you know, I would, I would have access to, uh, so many cartoons and, and spot illustrations over the years. Um, I, I absolutely love working with the copy editing team. Uh, I studied copy editing in college. Um, so the, the nerd inside of me was, you know, still loves being part of email exchanges where, um, we'll go back and forth over, you know, whether a single letter should be capitalized, um, you know, deciding whether the in and sign in should be capitalized was, was a series of meetings, um, which I absolutely love. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's a total dream to be able to work at the publication and, and to work with um, the people that I get to interact with every day. Any other questions that came in? Um, there's one more. Do you have any experience um, with the payment side of things? And have you ever done any experiments with micropayments for individual articles? Um, yeah, so payments is something that that's coming up. Uh, it's you know, something that we've been talking about a lot. You know, I mentioned um, international payments, for example. Um, you know, micropayments is not something that I, I personally have worked on, um, but I think there are a lot of questions out there. You know, especially as we talk about um, moving into a system where you know fewer people are, are paying by by check or or through cash and you know we are offering up a number of different ways to not only sign into the website but also pay for your subscription um and so i i would expect that we would continue exploring you know what what the easiest way is for someone to complete a transaction last chance for a question from the round for our guests Everybody's satisfied. Mm -hmm. Sophie, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, it was really, really interesting to yeah, hear you talk about, about your profession, what UX writing means at The New Yorker. And uh, yeah, all I can do at this stage is to wish you a really nice Thursday, because you are you have the whole Thursday almost ahead of you still. So, uh, <laughs> That's true. I'll go eat my lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Thank you, you so much guys. for having me. It was great meeting you all. <laughs> so I, I think I have to move this over uh, yeah. to Dominique now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, should I look into like, the webcam or no, the web webcam? Okay. You guys have the, the presentation open yeah, in the Adobe? Switch to uh, the keynote. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And I go on full screen. Hi. Yeah. So just to you have to turn it. Oh, yeah. so that, so, oh you, you can't see me. Okay. Um, maybe the other way around. Yeah. That's yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Uh, okay. So while you are sorting out the, the technical difficulties, how we're gonna uh, continue now is we have two short lightning talks. Dominic's gonna start with uh, neue Narrative. Um, we'll take a few questions after that, then we have the second lighting talk by the two of you, and then we do the panel discussion. Yeah. Yeah? But if you all the big questions for the panel discussion afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're the voice. You're basically the, our audience taking uh, part in the discussion. Um, yeah, but feel free uh, yeah. to start. <laughs> so hi, um, yeah, I'm Dominic. Um, I'm from Neue Narrative, and you probably haven't heard of us. Um, we are a bit of a niche magazine, very small yet. Um, we are like a business magazine, but we prefer like the term work magazine because like um, um, business magazines are mostly like geared toward upper management and stuff like that and stock market and so on. 
we don't really care about that. Uh, we are more like working. Uh, um, uh, how we work is especially interesting for us, and that applies to everyone, like on every level of the company. Uh, also, self-employed people and um, people working trades and stuff like that. So um, we are more like uh, uh, lower approach to to that. And um, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about like what we do. Um, especially if you don't know us yet. And uh, then I'm gonna focus on how we do it and how we got where we are at the moment. And yeah, so um, we started out in 2017. So we are uh, three years old now, not 95 years. Um, <laughs> I hope we get to that. And um, we come out three times a year. So very um, low frequency for magazine, but uh, this actually works in our favor, I guess I'm gonna get back to that later. And every um, edition is focused on one theme and we explore this theme as uh, thoroughly as possible. And we have a circulation of 10,000 copies. Um, actually, we had 15,000 before, but we scaled back. I'm gonna explain why also later and um, yeah, we, we print a magazine cradle to cradle, um, so that means uh, like uh, the highest grade of um, green printing you can do at the moment. Uh, like uh, all the materials are recyclable and come from green sources, not only paper but also the ink and stuff like that. And the uh, transport is uh, compensated as well, so um, that is actually a bit expensive, but uh, it's worth it for us. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and we are a small team of 10 employees, roughly. Um, and we have a core team of six members, which you can see us here. And um, the others are freelancers, uh, not freelancers, but like part time. And uh, the magazine itself is mostly done by those six you can see here, and me being one of them. And yeah, you can also see how we were working for last year of course but also before uh, like we are um, very remote um, uh, even before corona but of course like when corona kicked in um, we um, switched to being completely remote so i, I haven't seen this, these guys um, for a long time i have seen them once this year uh, or like once from since february and that was to have some drinks and not to work and everything we do happens remotely and yeah that's what the magazine looks like I'm not going to go too much into the design because I think we can talk about this uh, design stuff later on uh, in, uh, um, all together. And uh, you might see that we try to be different from other business magazines, like uh, you won't see anyone wearing a suit and tie and stuff like that. And um, you're very bright, uh, very colorful, very playful. But um, when it comes to information, we stick to uh, um, clear, clean information. We try to be simple there, but uh, with the rest, we um, yeah, have fun and uh, try out different stuff. And um, we do some special stuff that other magazines don't do. Um, for example, we have tools in our magazine. Uh, we, we call those tools, it's like, um, uh, methods you can use in workshops and stuff like that. It's actually very common uh, in like the new work consultancy area. Um, and normally these tools are, can get very expensive. Like people sell them for hundreds of euros and we give them away for free in the magazine. And we also like um, have a special tool edition. We can just have the tools and stuff like that. And um, yeah, this is actually like, we try to be a little bit interactive in print, which is Kind of weird, I guess, but um, so far it worked out very nicely, and it's nice that we can do stuff like like that. Um, it actually challenges us every time. How can we make this tool like in, uh, engaging, and uh, we want people to actually write into the magazine and stuff like that. We have place for taking notes. We ask questions uh, to our readers in the beginning and the end and stuff like that. So. We try to have it more like a playbook, a workbook, not just like a normal magazine you keep pristine and uh, don't touch. And yeah, um, we don't have any ads in a magazine um, apart from uh, we recently started doing one page of sponsors. You can see that in the, the, the yellow pages here, and uh, where um, we have some sponsors and just little text. And sometimes uh, we do sponsored articles, but uh, 
we are very conscious that um, uh, we don't have like these um, advertorials or however you may call them. So um, these are normal articles that happen to revolve around a specific company and we get paid uh, for that. Um, I'm gonna go into finances later, but I'm gonna talk about uh, how much money we make with this, this kind of stuff. And uh, we also have, besides the magazine, we have some um, digital products. This is our audio trainings that started recently. Um, we are developing a series of audio trainings you can do um, while working or at least to have your hands free and do stuff while um, you get trainings on the first one is uh, about um, self-organization and currently we are working on one uh, called um, how to fight, richtig streiten in German. Uh, and we also do a new work glossary that's actually a free homepage um, because the world of new work uh, is very laden with buzzwords you might have noticed and even we don't <laughs> know any um, uh, um, lots of them especially the new ones and uh, uh, the glossary is a, a kind of uh, resource you can go to and look up what does this uh, fancy new word mean and it's, uh, we try to keep it very short, um, so it's a quick way to get inf information and yeah, it's completely free. We make some money um, with uh, sponsorships for certain words, um, but uh, yeah, it's more like a side project um, that is more fun to us. And yeah, and uh, I talked about um, how we scaled back our circulation from 15,000 to 10,000 copies. Um, we was um, just like any other magazine, you could buy us like anywhere you could buy magazines, like at train stations and bookshops. And we stopped doing that um, recently um, because, um, as you can see, um, we um, sent 5,000 copies um, to shops and we only sold about 1,700, which I guess is a very good cut um, in the world of magazines and newspapers as well. But uh, the rest of uh, copies um, were destroyed um, or um, thrown into the recycling bin. And uh, yeah, this pissed us off, off uh, very much because um, uh, we put a lot of love uh, in, into printing, uh, also a lot of money. And uh, yeah, we have definitely higher printing costs than other magazines that print on cheap paper and don't care about um, uh, green uh, stuff. So. Uh, this hurt us very much and we tried uh, to organize a way to um, get the unsold copies back to us but it's actually not possible um, it's too much uh, effort and we picked up some of some of the um, unsold copies ourselves but uh, yeah this doesn't work uh, when you are uh, sold in uh, germany austria and switzerland and uh, yeah this hurt us very much and at the same time we didn't make a lot of money for um, the sales there um, uh, we earned 8,000 euros, but uh, 7,500 euros of those uh, went into like logistics, uh, printing, and so on. And we only made 500 euros back, um, which is um, just 10 cents per, per copy. Uh, yeah, um, which is fine. I mean, um, the um, the main reason we we were at at the stores is like not for getting getting sold there, but uh, have it as an advertising space so people can be aware of of us. But at one point we thought like uh, that this um, it's too, too much of a cost to pay for some kind of advertising. And so we switched to a completely um, subscription-based um, model. Actually, when we started out, we, we said we never want to do subscriptions <laughs> uh, because it's like an old school um, way of doing things and we tried to be like new school and uh, do everything different, but it turned out like subscriptions are actually quite nice. And um, because, yeah, they give you safety and um, uh, they, it's a very good way to support a magazine and we offer two kinds of subscriptions, actually a few more, but there's a special subscriptions and we have uh, basic and karma. Basic is just like you um, pay the normal price for three magazines and get them sent to you once uh, um, for one year. And karma is the same, but uh, 10 euro more. And it's just like, if you if you um, enjoy reading us um, and if you have the money, just give us 10 euro more and it would be nice of you. And as you can see, uh, actually um, more than half of the um, subscribers uh, are willing to pay us 10 euro more without getting anything more. Sometimes we send 
little digital tools and stuff like that in a way, but uh, yeah, it's very little you gain more. So it's just like we have a very nice readership that actually supports us. And yeah, so this is um, how 2020 went for us so far. And actually, it's quite funny because at the moment we have an exactly 50-50 balance of uh, expenses and income. Uh, so these are latest numbers from uh, five days ago. And um, yeah, uh, so we just turned around making a profit. It doesn't look like it's here because it's the whole year, but the last few months uh, we actually were making profit. And for the first uh, two and a half years, uh, yeah, um, we are operating at, at a loss, but um, that's pretty normal. Um, and we don't have huge losses because we are very small. We don't have that much expenses. I think 180 uh, euros expenses for more than half of a year is uh, quite low uh, in comparisons to other magazines. And uh, yeah, and you can see um, how, how this adds up. So most of the stuff we get is from magazine sales, subscriptions and stuff like that. Um, we do have some B2B, that's sponsorships. And, um, and shop sales is our online shop and uh, trainings as we do trainings um, on the site. And um, those are our, our four main ways of income. And uh, one interesting thing that also happened uh, recently is uh, we are now a purpose ownership. Uh, this means um, that um, uh, the company is owned by uh, the people working in the company and can't be uh, owned uh, by an investor. We can't be bought. Um, we have the Purpose Foundation um, uh, as part of our um, company and they prevent, uh, they have a veto right, so no one can buy us out. No big publisher can come along and even if we would like to get um, acquired by a publisher, we, we can't. So. Uh, um, the company will always belong to the people working in it, and only the people working in it at the moment. And um, I won't go into detail that much, but we could talk about it later because um, I think it's quite interesting and it's very unique, especially in the, in the media um, world. Uh, I think you're the first media company doing this stuff. And I see I don't have much time left, so I'm going to go quickly about how we work, which would be my focus on the, uh, of, of this talk. But um, yeah, um, we are a new work magazine and uh, everything we write about, we do ourselves as well. Um, so uh, we work uh, very agile um, um, and uh, this is our strategy process you can see here. Um, we have different processes as well, but I want to focus on strategy shortly. Um, so this is um, how we decide what we want to do. And, um, we uh, meet um, every quarter, um, we have a strategy meeting and we decide on three objectives, only three, not more. Um, uh, and those three objectives we um, uh, try to make happen in, in the upcoming three months. And um, we define the three of those three ob objectives via key results and then we create projects and uh, um, our roles um, uh, are working in these projects. Um, what are roles? Um, so we don't have jobs. We don't have job descriptions. I just said I'm art director, but that is just on our communication to the outside uh, because it makes stuff easier. Um, uh, internally, we don't have any job descriptions. So um, uh, you wear roles, like you wear hats. So uh, I have uh, the designer hat on, but I also have like the uh, print communication hat on. Actually. I am the only person that is actually just doing stuff that could fit all into one uh, uh, job description. The other ones are uh, much more diverse in their jobs. So you do what you do best and only what you do best. And uh, you don't have anyone telling you what to do. Um, uh, if you have a role, um, you are the boss of that role and no one interferes with, with you. And uh, so the roles are um, competency-based. Every, everyone does what they do best. And if some stuff needs to be done um, and no one does it really good, uh, you try to fill this role with, with something new or you adapt to it. And yeah, so these are our roles. So some of, of our roles you can see here. I don't know if you can read it, but uh, yeah, roles again, you can name them anything. It's just like um, in these roles, you define accountabilities you have. and uh, this gives you um, like a framework, okay, these are my accountabilities, this is stuff I need to do. And um, 
is your um, responsibility to fulfill them and no one is checking back on you. So you can, you can do the work however you like, how, how you see you fit and uh, it works out quite nicely. So this is uh, what is called self-organization, or at least some part of it. And uh, these are our objectives and key results um, for this quarter. So we are um, developing a new audio training and we are um, trying to grow um, on our B2C. Um, and uh, we um, try to come up with um, uh, new products that are geared towards higher priced um, uh, customers. And uh, you can see um, the percentages are where we at with those right now. So we always keep track uh, every week. Uh, we see uh, how, how far are we there. And uh, you can see the um, third objective is, yeah, um, we need to do some, some more in that regard. And these are our projects, um, uh, also like recently, so this is also from yesterday. Um, this is like the layer below the key results, and uh, these are the projects you pick and choose, and this is your responsibility to fulfill those projects. And you can see as well that every project is um, geared toward one objective. Um, we don't do nearly nothing that is not geared towards those three um, objectives. Um, there's some stuff that needs to get done, that, but like 95% of our actual work is always geared towards those three objectives, and then in the next quarter we can do other stuff. It sometimes hurts because sometimes you want to do stuff um, that um, you think is urgent, but uh, we really focus on these three objectives and everything else has to wait. Um, the magazine is a bit self um, Centered, so um, it's not a part of those three objectives. The magazine is always going on, um, but uh, yeah, I, I can talk about the magazine process, I guess, later on as well. I don't want to, I could go into this deeper, but uh, I think um, it's fine for now. Um, so if you are interested in uh, our magazine and uh, want to know uh, or want to see one, uh, you can download a free copy um, of this one, our edition number eight, which is the, um, not the recent one, but uh, the one before. And this uh, link will be into our shop where you can enter the code product crunch. The code will only be active for seven days. Um, so hurry up. And I think you can post like the link in the Twitch. Um, yeah. And also, um, if you want to sign up to our newsletter, we will be giving away 3,000 copies for free of this magazine in the next weeks. And so if, um, if you want to join the newsletter, then you will be notified of that. And that's, that's, yeah, I hope you can get one. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. The copies you give away, are these the ones you collected again? From yeah, the um, yeah it's been, it, it was a very recent step that we decided, OK, now it's it, it hurts and we have lots left and um, why not give it away, yeah. Okay, really cool. Um, I would say let's take maybe, um, yeah, two questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, before I ask the question, um, I just wanted to say it's the first um, magazine or book that people pick up in our library. So if people come to our <laughs> office and look around, it's one of the first ones they pick up. And then usually the second question is like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> and my one second pitch is, especially if they're German speaking, I say it's Brand 1 für Waldorf Schüler. And I mean that in the most positive way possible. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I, I like it. Um, we always like this, not, not like a rivalry between, between Brand 1 and, and us, but like um, we are two very design focused business magazine. But as I said, Brand 1 is more like upper management, I would say. And we, we try to be like very inviting for anyone who is working, which is everyone, I guess. And uh, also, like, um, we get the same because people pick it up because it looks like very colorful, playful, um, especially the covers. And uh, if it would look like a work magazine, I don't think we would get the same response. And that's what we, we're trying to trick people into uh, reading us. Yeah. <laughs> into buying an art magazine. Yeah. <laughs> And okay. there are two questions that um, I think we should ask. The first one is from Lissy, and she says, um, what made you decide to go for this purpose ownership model? What made you make that decision? So, uh, yeah, um, it just it gives us safety. Um, and um, we always liked the idea of purpose ownership. Um, uh, it was a very long process. I think it took over a year. And um, we think it's a model that could work for 
any um, company. Um, actually, like we are the only magazine or media company um, doing this in Germany at the moment, but there are lots of other companies, especially startups, but also um, bigger companies. And I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about capitalism and so on, but it's just like, um, it prevents uh, the unhealthy form of capitalism where um, the company is not working for the company but working for stakeholders and people who have stocks. And this can't happen with us. You can, I, I just heard you went public. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there are different ways of doing this. You can be a good company uh, with stocks as well and so on. This is just like for us, um, uh, um, I think it's. Um, uh, the safest way and also um, it gives uh, a very good idea and we want to, to promote uh, this I idea and so we are very vocal about it. We, um, we, um, in, in the news edition we have a long article how we went uh, this way. We also have a long medium article and we will continue writing about this so just follow us. Uh, um, we are very vocal and try to promote this. The second question is from Boris, our managing director. So <laughs> just to give you some context, he says, how does the salary structure look like? That's actually, um, um, yeah, we have um, in every um, edition, we have one um, column that is called Transparenzbericht, Transparency Report. And the last one was about uh, why we don't sell at stores anymore. And the next one is going to be salaries, which is actually quite interesting. Um, because, uh, yeah, salaries are, I guess again, uh, very different than uh, with other magazines. We don't get paid much. Um, we actually get paid, um, if I want to go, go back to the purpose ownership, we um, pay ourselves with uh, shares in the company as well. So um, we can re reduce our monthly workload. I, I can say my, um, I currently earn, uh, earn uh, 2,500 euros per month. And after taxes, there's like one seven hundred euros left. So um, not very much. I could earn definitely much more in other companies and uh, other magazines as well. But uh, yeah, we're not in it for, for the money. Other people are even earning less um, uh, in our magazine. Some are even working for free for, uh, for the moment uh, because yeah, we we want to push this forward and uh, get to a point where this is profitable and yeah, we just reached this point and uh, we are willing to sacrifice uh, some uh, stuff for, for that and yeah, um, even if I earn much less money or a little less money than I earned before I, I got into Neue Native, it's just like the best place I've worked ever uh, because yeah, it's a very different way of working and I like it. Looking forward to the next edition. The yeah. transparency yeah. report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks so much um, for your um, yeah little lightning talk. Uh, really, really interesting yeah. hearing how you organize yourselves, how you kind of set focus every year, and how you track also this progress, especially as a as a magazine. Um, and how that works there. Um, but yeah, I want to actually move on to the Freitag, which is this beautiful publication here. Uh, uh, to Lisa and Susan. Um, yeah, we're again moving the <laughs> laptop over there. Yeah, and maybe quickly. Can you find your. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, we're ready. So, when you guys are ready, feel free to start. Yeah, we are ready. <laughs> yes, as I said before, or I think we just said it, as I'm Lisa and uh, yeah, this is Suzanne. Suzanne is illustrating the illustrating the digital artwork for the Freitag, and I'm responsible for the art direction. Yes, and the Freitag, for those of you who don't know, it's a weekly newspaper. And um, yes, thanks so much for inviting us. Uh, so now um, we take a deep breath. <laughs> we are um, in 2020, and yes, for us and I think everybody else, it really has been an intense year. It's really has been totally crazy. Yeah, yeah. Considering our title, um, we are really grumpy and in a bad mood, but for a good reason because either the world is coming to an end this year or in the near future, and yeah, let me describe um, our everyday 
live uh, in the editorial office to you because for leftist journalists it's um, really important that they have a special culture of debate, yes, which, we think, yeah, which we think is really important for the quality uh, of the newspaper. Um, Yes, but we've only worked left-wing editorial <laughs> offices so far, so <laughs> we can't uh, really compare. <laughs> yeah, but the term grumpy is meant really in a loving way, um, because there's a lot of tension, dispute and controversy in the conference room, and it may seem exhausting to work uh, for a newspaper because of the constant disaster situation we are facing, just only to mention the climate change, racism, Trump, patriarchy, inequality, and of course the pandemic we're living in. Um, yes, and um, as a small examination, we scanned uh, the front page, uh, the cover page of Der Freitag, I think it was uh, two weeks ago when we were preparing for this talk, and yeah, it's really infuriating. You can read it for yourself, and yeah, exploitation, terror, anger. Worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah, it's really depressing topics and um, <laughs> yes, uh, so on the one hand we have um, a lot of crisis and on the other hand uh, we have the good looks <laughs> and uh, we think there's nothing like going out in style. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yes, uh, we think left journalism especially must have um, more than refreshing and also interesting look because we really want people to read our newspaper. And um, yes, uh, we often have um, politically very weighty topics and also it's very demanding. And so um, in contrast to that, we try to make it visually more relaxed and also therefore easily accessible. So um, also left journalism often has kind of a dusty image and we, re we really think this is unacceptable. I mean, um, it's 2020. <laughs> and, um, and yes, uh, so our, um, our claim, kind of or our slogan is, if, if the um, text is um, too hard to read, um, we try to make the image even more intriguing. It should be catchy. Um, it should really um, throw, uh, throw you into the text. And therefore, the Visual, visual ideas are very simple and clear. Um, with dry texts um, that are hard to read, we try to encounter more humorously, um, like shown in this example. This was an article about the privatization of pensions. And I mean, uh, you can see for yourself, uh, I think the old people look really happy, um, <laughs> even though their pensions just got cut. Or in this example, um, Yes, and maybe um, they are so happy because also they represent um, a large group of our readership <laughs> and uh, therefore they also must know everything about Marx. Yeah, because Marx never gets old uh, for Lenses <laughs> journalists and their readers. Um, we really love the spirit white old man and also just <laughs> to the Marx idol statues. Um, as you may know, there are not many images of Marx and they all look quite the same. And I think there hasn't been a year uh, of their Freitag where we haven't got uh, Marx on the title page. Um, so it's always a challenge um, to uh, promote his fresh ideas with fresh illustrations and he became kind of like a visual running gag. Um, and if Marx were here today, he might ask uh, why is gender appropriate language uh, indispensable or what is meant by the term diversity. Yes, um, so that's another thing. We really try to show diversity. Um, because we, and you all know, the world is not just made up of old white men. Like Marx. <laughs> <laughs> like Marx. And uh, as art directors and graphic designers, um, we really have um, the possibility to show marginalized groups in pictures. Um, we can work with them, we can even hire them, um, and, uh, and um, use our power also in leading positions to um, support them that way. And, for us, it's important to do it not in a forced way, but um, um, to illustrate um, this in a respective uh, way and also appropriately. So, 
yes, we um, have to become aware of our privileges um, again and again and ask ourselves, in, uh, ourselves anew, like uh, weekly, um, are the BIPOCs in the newspapers represented respectfully? How many women do we show in which context? Um, is this represent representation of LGBTQ um, appropriate, etc., etc.? And yes, it's an ongoing discussion for us. Yeah, as you can see, there's a wide range of topics like classism, Black Lives Matter, um, but also working women. And uh, I'm going to show you two more in, in detail. Um, this title was um, immediately done after the terrible shootings in Hanau. And for me, as a title designer, it's always really, really hard to find images for right-wing terrorism. And luckily, our editorial office um, collected migrant voices, and um, I typographically arranged and hand-drawn them. And I really like that we focus on the claims and not on the victim status in this example, and let the people who are affected speak for themselves and not let others write about it. Um, yeah, and we don't have to show Nazis, um, which we don't really want <laughs> to do. And another favorite title, maybe our, some of our all-time favorite um, titles, is uh, this one um, about the non-invasive blood test um, for Down syndrome. Um, as you may know, the discussion is quite controversial in Germany, and our great uh, image photo editor came across this great photo series um, from uh, Smith Hanna from Büding, and she portrayed um, this 19-year-old girl with Down syndrome in a very cool and intimate way, and we fought really, really hard to get this picture on the front page because um, the photographer was really aware, and she wanted to read the article and so on. Um, um, the title translates to You Don't Want to Have Us, which also kind of polarizes. Um, yeah. Yes, the well, photo series is also a very um, important uh, thing for Der Freitag and for the visual language of, um, or the visual storytelling of Der Freitag. Yes, and uh, so we have on a regular basis supplements in the newspaper for the Frankfurt or Leipzig Art Book Fair. Um, we do reading samples or uh, long reads or yeah, like crime literature specials. Um, yes, and on these pages we have a lot of freedom to um, promote series from either photographers or illustrators. And um, Yes, there the, st um, the um, series tells the story for itself and it does not illustrate single articles. So in this example, um, it's a crime special and it's a black and white photographer. Um, and um, we really love um, this edgy and dark touch. It's mysterious and um, has a high contrast. Um, we think it fits very well also on a meta level. Uh, it's a work by Andre Viking, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> yes, and um, what we also do is feature illustration series. This one is also, I really love um, this illustrator. It's, her, her name is um, Jill Zenf, and this was a series from her. Um, uh, the colors are very bold, it's uh, quirky, it's loud. Um, I think it's just fun to watch, and it's also a perfect example how we use contemporary illustration. Um, uh, within the newspaper, and we like this so we can stay on the pulse of time um, within the newspaper. Yeah, speaking of time, um, it's really sad that uh, the weekly world gets old um, so so quick. Um, so, what can you do with an old newspaper? Uh, you can decorate your living room with a carpet um, woven from old Der Freitag shoes, <laughs> or you can send us. Christmas postcards made from illustrated titles. These two were actually <laughs> gifts from our readers. Um, <laughs> we really had to show this. Um, but you can also use uh, use it as a protest sign, like this woman um, in the demonstration against the AfD in Thüringen um, with Bodo Ramelow. Um, or you can use it as a coloring book. Yes, uh, this is uh, one of our Christmas issues from 2018. It was about identity and yes, it was meant to be colored out by our readers, so we wanted to create a kind of interaction with the reader. 
and wanted him to play with it um, and also um, respond to the recent um, coloring, average coloring book trend. So yeah, it was 32 pages mm -hmm. all meant to be colored up. Yeah, and to keep up with the trend, um, everything continually changes and um, as a new weekly newspaper, I, we think it's really important that you um, embrace growth and change because uh, we, we want to postulate print is not dead and I think you need to some other fever. The Freitag has an eventful history which starts around 1945, but um, to shorten things, we start in 1990. That's uh, the old Freitag, and um, it started um, as an east west um, newspaper, like connecting the two parts of Germany. And these are about to take um, a phone call, and I'm discovering uh, what a newspaper actually is. And the two of us are kind of east-west duo for itself because I'm from Brandenburg and this is from Kiel. Um, so about the time, um, these are during the first uh, Berliner Weisse in Kreuzberg and I'm about uh, to play punk rock. Um, the writer becomes more and more colorful and when you have a look, closer look on the front page, there are really funny teaser images in the front row and we have also charming mustard ad <laughs> right on the page one. Yeah, um, time flies. Yes, and then in 2009 uh, we get a big redesign. Uh, that was right after, or a little bit after, Jakob Aufstein takes over the Freitag. And uh, yes, the newly designed uh, Freitag is published. It has new looks, new fonts, um, a great font family by Lucas de Gros, um, which still works perfectly well and fine till today. It's a huge recognition factor and. Yes, we just start studying graphic design. So, <laughs> uh, yes, and this is, um, fast forward to 2019. It's um, after a lot of small adjustments, um, the first um, big redesign project after this time, and um, Herr Freitag gets a new page one, a new cover uh, look, and so we take all the useless elements away, like the pink box on the top right, um, we um, push the logo up to the top, um, yes, we just basically tidy up. Uh, we give ourselves a more generous um, image format and kind of create a flexible system. So um, this is the result of this. Um, uh, so now, uh, there's um, three versions, uh, it's one half cover and one full cover and one half cover and split, so um, this one gives us a chance to um, have uh, different um, themes on the um, cover page and yes, uh, we think it works pretty well, it's now it's been one year and the responses are well and yes, it's yeah. easier for Suzanne yeah. to make great covers. Because <laughs> as you can see there's a really, really yeah. square image from it and it's so much better now. Yeah. So, um, yes, what's next? Um, we really don't know what's next <laughs> and what's going to happen after 2020. Yes, but um, at this point, I think it's uh, still comforting to know that there are people that are willing to work for a better tomorrow. And in the meantime, we will provide the good looks for the bad news. <laughs> and now we are at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Same procedure with you guys, mm -hmm. Monica. Yes. <laughs> I would say we do one question, or how many questions are there? Two. Oh, two? Yeah. Okay, let's do two. They, they both deserve um, air time. Okay. So, design that is back again. He <laughs> says, with all the right wing assholes on the rise, I wonder if you need a lot of courage to do your job. Anyway, big fan of the newspaper, got my grandma to read it. Thank you. That's <laughs> nice to hear. Do you want to answer to that? Um, uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not like that we are like Charlie at the door. We have no, we get some really angry uh, letters from our readers, or not really our readers, but we get a lot of angry letters. But we have like people who filter it out, and yeah. And as a designer, you are not that present. I think so as a journalist, you are more exposed. Yeah. So. Um, 
to my private ID address, I didn't get any yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to provoke anyone, but well, I think it's really important. And uh, I like the idea that I like the kind of sense to, to what I'm doing. Yeah, me. So, so to me. Um, and the last question is from Lucy Wow. Um, she says, how do the discussions regarding injustice and misrepresentation take place at their Park? Does the whole team get a say in it? How do you decide what images to choose? And do you discuss with your hopefully diverse team? With your hopefully what? Diverse team. Um, so at their Park, I think everything is really small. So um, uh, mostly the um, decisions about pictures and the visual language stays with our, uh, within our art, art, direct, um, art department team. So we within discussions a lot, and we also discuss on those um, topics. But then for the title, it's a little bit different. It's a bigger team, and um, yes, <laughs> I think we have a. We have a lot of to say. Uh, we, we have yeah, not we like a libido, but uh, we can say no. We can't show like three men in a row on the front page. That's not what we're gonna do in 2020. And yeah, when we are focusing on the um, um, current issue, we always check, double check. Oh, there are too many women in the politic part, so we need more women in the cultural part. I don't know. So. Yeah, something like that. Yes, and then I also think it makes a big difference um, once the team is um, more mixed as well. Uh, I mean, I think I started four or five years ago, then Suzanne joined me, and now I think the art department team is um, mixed. I mean, it's 50-50, mm -hmm. uh, I think, women and men. I think this already makes a big difference. Also, with, within the title team, it makes a big difference as there is only one woman or no women at all. Um, uh, or if it's um, equally. Mm -hmm. I hope this answers <laughs> the question. Yeah, I think we can continue right here. I would like to open our discussion and enter the panel. So, um, yeah, we have our audience here with Moni. <laughs> but uh, do you guys have questions for each other right away? Otherwise, I have lots of questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I noticed that you have a strong focus on illustration. In I don't think I can see really a photograph. Mm. Yeah, um, we have some photographs, but um, we try to only use them for like um, reportage uh, reports, uh, where it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to illustrate it and stuff like that. Um, we have two interviews um, per magazine, of course, they are photographed as well, and um, yeah, I think that's it. We don't lean away from photographs. Actually, uh, I, I'm trying at the moment to uh, get more photography into uh, graphics, like have photographic infographics and stuff like that. Um, so experimenting more with that, that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, we definitely are um, illustration first, um, <laughs> just because um, yeah, we have two illustrators in our team, uh, me being one of them, and uh, we always uh, try to get many illustrators in the magazine as well. And I think what makes it much easier for us uh, are the different, the different publication cycles. I guess for a newspaper, it's much harder to illustrate stuff when it has to be done by next week uh, or in the next few days uh, to get ready for the printing press, and we can take time. And we believe that it, that we can. Um, illustrate um, stuff much more finely when we illustrate it. So um, uh, it would be boring to just show the same photographs of office spaces. And yeah, the whole business world is not visually that appealing. Um, and we are mostly writing about concepts. And uh, yeah, uh, for, for this abstract kind of stuff, uh, illustrations are always better. Um, yeah, but we're not opposed to, photo the, to photography, so it just happened. Yeah, I really yeah. like the approach, yeah. but it's funny that you mentioned because we do a lot of illustrations, maybe, but more on ourselves. Yeah, that's actually one of my questions back to you. Um, how do you manage that on this tight schedule? Um, I mean, you just said like the title page um, that you illustrated yourself, uh, the typographic illustrations for mm -hmm. the terror attack, which is whole different world of <laughs> illustrations than we, but we care uh, with, uh, like, uh, yeah, um, 
very hard, I think, working for the, those kind of topics. But then again, like the deadline, um, how, how do you manage uh, squeezing illustrations in your normal process? Yeah, great colleague. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very small team, but then I think everybody kind of has a, has a illustrator visual thinking, even the, um, pic, uh, the photograph, photo editors, they think really visually and um, I think this really helps and that um, the graphic designers that work at um, Freitag, they all do illustrations and that's how we can also last minute, do last, like little last minute illustration and stuff like that. Yeah, sometimes it's like on a Monday afternoon, uh, title is done and I have some time left and I'm doing a five minute pitch to Lisa and say, okay, I have an idea for page three, let's do it. And then I have like a day to make this illustration. And sometimes that you have like such a tight deadline produces sometimes really cool stuff because you have to decide and you don't play around that much. Um, but you also do sometimes like easy um, Freisteller, I don't know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Like easy collages, I think a lot of um, uh, artwork that um, um, comes up last minute is mostly collage also mm -hmm. than uh, the yeah, or vector illustration. Yeah. 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 It's quite interesting, I think, all the range of time we had at this table. I mean, uh, let's not forget about Sophie. <laughs> she left <laughs> now, but she, um, I mean, the New Yorker also, yeah. she, she mentioned it has some more um, like fast journalism, I'm, I'm calling it now, that is mostly digital. Then uh, I would say we have you for like every week, and then you guys with every four months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and of course, yeah, I'm also like, the level of illustration. I think the New Yorker is like the perfect example for like the, I mean, every illustrator wants to get into the New Yorker and, and they are like, it's their identity, um, at least visually um, are these illustrations. And uh, yeah, um, I think that's also, you won't see this kind of illustrations with our magazine. Mostly because of financial reasons, <laughs> not because of uh, time constraints and stuff like that, but uh, yeah, um, uh, I think it's a very wide range illustration. It's just like design, uh, you can have like top notch, uh, high polished stuff. And I guess we tend to work more uh, simpler stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think it yeah, it's can create um, more interesting stuff as well, I think. Yeah. When we met just before uh, our talk here, you said like, if you want me, I can rant about digital publishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, like, yeah, I'm curious about what, I mean, I think both of your um, magazine and publications have certain digital elements. Yeah. Um, one uh, audience member asked Sophie, uh, do you prefer uh, digital or print? What about you guys? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, it's hard to say if I prefer digital or print, it always depends uh, on what I'm reading. And I don't want to sound offensive, but normally news uh, I consume digitally um, just for the ease of use. Um, and because I don't consume news ritually, like on the, my breakfast table and stuff like that, it just like happens uh, um, on my way to somewhere or something, stuff like that. So. Uh, yeah, normally news, I personally um, read digitally and um, there's a whole different world uh, with uh, how news can be represented digitally because the yeah, speed is everything and you can see it's very rough uh, sometimes and you, uh, yeah, there's not much you can do. And then you have like the stuff that the uh, New Yorker does, like these very elaborate uh, um, pieces that are like uh, sub home pages of themselves. Experiences. Yeah, and they are of course great, and we would love doing this kind of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, this takes so much time uh, and money, uh, especially um, if you had those resources. That's definitely a direction you would like to go. And for us, uh, um, yeah, digital is like a pain point at the moment. Um, we're currently reworking our homepage um, just to um, have a, a more modern and more flexible way, but um, it's it's hard to convey like the passion that goes into a printed magazine and into a digital space. Uh, no app can represent uh, 
the stuff you think about in a as a in a design uh, every spread is like a mini poster and you try to balance it out and um, it works somehow um, on, a, on an iPad. I mean, if you open a PDF on an iPad, um, you get pretty close to what the original design was intended to. But um, I really hate those online articles that are like basically blog posts where you have like one scroll down and uh, mm -hmm. there you have your images in between. But that's what we're doing at the moment. That's that's where we are going at the moment because that's just all the alternatives are too costly and. We would love to have an an app for for our um, uh, um, readers, but um, yeah, apps don't make sense for a small team in the long run with a small budget. Apps need to be updated; uh, they always cost. And uh, we are trying to develop a progressive web app that can work as an app as well as a homepage. Mm -hmm. I think that's a way to go. And there's much more stuff you can do on the web um, than few years ago so that's also interesting but yeah uh, we are not, not we're not there yet and we will try to get there but i will always prefer the printed magazine yeah. business that kind of stuff and uh, of course like yeah it's just that like you don't get this frame and it, it looks like a poster in, in, in this size especially if you have like a full frame image um, up there it's, it's more like a poster and we don't have those screens yet. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, to hear yeah. from the two of you. Yeah, like, what yes. does have to happen so that this would work digitally? Is it even possible? Uh, we, yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah, we have a web app also, and there, there are, there's an approach um, to translate this to online. Um, I think there was a redesign two years ago of the website, and they also used the great fonts by Lucas de Gros uh, on the website. But yeah, as I said before, um, yeah, we, we do some kind of digital work as well, like Instagram channel and um, but sometimes like I think what it was a good example which translates really not really good for us to web is like page like this. Like the microphone. Um, because we have like three articles that um, focus on the complex on Russia, energy, uh, Navalny, and foreign politics. It's really complex. And in the middle, we have like really simple graphs, uh, graphics on um, where the energy in Germany comes from and where do we, do we get our gas. So And how online, is, this is an article, this is an article, this is a single article. So you can't really connect them. Like you connect them on paper, and it's a shame, and I don't have the answer for it. I think the New Yorker does it pretty, pretty good, also. But um, uh, I used to be a print subscriber, and now I'm a digital subscriber, and I'm not reading the New Yorker right now. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's really it's a shame. Mm -hmm. Do you consider, like, take this into consideration when you do the illustrations like here, how it might look in the digital space, or is it paper first approach? For us it's still paper first. Um, and what I think is interesting about this, uh, as you mentioned, the Instagram account, that um, what you also can see on the website and with, um, within the newspaper as a visual language for itself, like when you go on the Instagram account or even the website, even though that it's not perfectly um, balanced um, maybe with the layout and the app and everything but still you have a certain visual language and I think that's what is a big of the fighter and um, power design also the very good intelligent images the good illustrations it's a loud language and I think that that is already transformed um, mm -hmm. yes but we don't have the capacities right now to <laughs> have a um, yes a a graphic design team for online that's not really yeah I always envy um, the Tagesspiegel infographic project they have online mm -hmm. like they're, they're doing on bi bicycle driving in Berlin mm -hmm. or I don't know like really, really um, um, that's but that's a really interesting trend uh, I think because in the last years um, you had kind of like a shift to uh, this uh, programmed infographics online, and now I have the feeling that it costs too much. I don't see it that often anymore. I don't know if 
as anyone hmm. discovered it. Yeah, um, yeah, they're just very expensive, I yeah. guess. But I would love to uh, have an online magazine that just does that, um, like where every every article is completely different and interpreted in a way that fits it. I think, yeah, uh, I don't know who can afford this kind of stuff, but I would be interested in that, um, just as an experiment, even. Yeah. An infographic illustration only. Yeah, yeah. Digital yeah. magazine. Moving. Yeah. What I found interesting, I mean, both of your magazines and publications had approaches to be more interactive. You know, your Christmas edition, I think it was, your um, inclusion of tools. Yeah, yeah. Do you have further ideas or do you have further ambitions to make your work more interactive or was this a one off thing? Uh. Can you give me the yeah. last question? Yeah. Uh, we have kind of like similarity to the <laughs> New York. <Yeah. laughs> Every week uh, we post uh, on social media an image and our readers uh, should find uh, a caption for this image that also yeah, some yeah. interactive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's hard to interact um, with readers in the long run. I, I really like all your... but that, yeah. that's that's on top of the magazine, like podcast. definitely, and I mean that is a niche case. I think like these uh, uh, workshop tools that we offer. Um, but yeah, we're also thinking about how it can be extend uh, this uh, kind of stuff. And I think like getting we 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 don't get like feedback from the readers on the magazine like, only over, over social media. I really like the idea like interviewing it more. We tried. Some stuff in the latest issue, like um, uh, um, uh, that people can photograph um, stuff from from the magazine and send them uh, to friends and stuff like that. But that's more like small experiments. Um, we were talking about augmented reality before, and I think this could be a way um, uh, to enhance um, uh, the reading experience. I don't want to do like. It's always like a very um, balancing act uh, when you have like a print product. You don't want to look at the screen next to a print product. I think technically we are not there yet uh, with no real viable print reality glasses stuff like that. But when I think like five to ten years in the future, I could really see this kind of stuff. I actually wrote my um, diploma thesis uh, in the university. I wrote it about. Uh, um, interactive schoolbook, and um, that is actually a case where we really think this could really work, like um, to convey information meaningfully. Um, what we see now in the publishing world, like in magazines, it's mostly like eye candy, uh, like oh yeah, yeah, so this illustration moves, um, which is nice, uh, but I wouldn't. Uh, uh, get my augmented reality glasses for for, for that. Um, <laughs> if it if it can, can en enhance the content uh, meaningfully, uh, like of a different kind of information or feedback uh, and stuff like that, then it makes sense. But uh, yeah, we we are experimenting, or I am uh, experimenting with this like augmented reality stuff you have on Instagram and so on. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of this stuff will come. Uh, in future editions, but nothing sparked my interest yet because all of it is just like on the surface. And yeah. I don't like it. It's interesting you said like just the augmentation, changing it a bit is not enough. It's more about kind of extended or enhanced, um, <laughs> enhanced reality. Like yeah. To really, how do we add another layer of, of content of information? Yeah. Um, time. I, uh, Okay. I just want to add one thing, because you mentioned already like, the Tagesspiegel, and I think they found a very nice niche with their daily newsletter, mm -hmm. and like uh, quarter-wise, or like district-wise, I mean, uh, and maybe not everybody knows it, but like Tagesspiegel is a huge part of newspaper, the daily newspaper, and they publish every day an individual newsletter for every district in Berlin, and, I, um, and I, yeah, they say they are very successful with it. Mm -hmm. I think this is such a nice niche they found uh, to connect uh, yeah, a physical newspaper with a digital add-on. Of course, I totally agree that it's on top of the magazine, but I think that's such a nice use case they found there to inform their target group in their district about urgent stuff. And that's, I think that's such a nice example of how you can uh, yeah, combine digital and 
analog uh, words, even if it's not as fancy as they are, of course. Yeah. It's just a newsletter. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing, one, one more thing is, I guess it works because a newsletter is so close to, to the print, yeah. right? It's a letter, yeah. it's a digital yeah. letter, yeah. and that's why it's so successful. I also uh, just briefly, I want to introduce you as well. Uh, <laughs> in case you're wondering who the <laughs> surprise guest is, it's uh, Felix. He's been filming. <laughs> <laughs> also with Good Patch, and he also has um, some football magazine yeah. that you work on. Oh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's just as a brief introduction in between. Now, <laughs> yeah, we want to pick up the ball, uh, so yes, to speak. Ball. Uh, yeah, um, uh, about the newsletters, and yeah, I also really like. Um, I think that, that's the future of regional uh, journalism. Um, 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 uh, it's always better to go smaller and more di direct, and I think uh, this can really help, um, uh, like uh, to. Um, to fragment and um, to um, so, so the readers can really pick and choose what they really like because that's what social media channels do and stuff. You build your own stuff, and the the smaller the fragments are um, that you can pick and choose from, it's 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 better. I, I don't need to read the whole newspaper. Um, um, I don't care about this. Sorry, sports <laughs> section, <laughs> and uh, so. Um, uh, but yeah, with the newspaper it's fine. Um, but yeah, it, it's always better. And I think that's the future to like cater more to uh, smaller and smaller core. And I think that's because that's the reason why we work because we also have a kind of niche audience. And uh, yeah, but you can uh, get a much better connection with this niche audience. Yeah, I think that's really a, a key point that you have like a strong identity so people who read your magazine or newspaper want to be seen with this i think that's a huge factor like in the cafe mm -hmm. am i more like the freitag reader or am i more like <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think yeah yeah really interesting yeah i, I have a question to, to all of you what, what Magazines or newspapers? Are you actually buying? <laughs> because I, yeah. um, print is not that. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> in print or in digital? Mm -hmm. uh, should I have started? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just I, go uh, as uh, as said, which I read online, which refers to your um, first question: what I read digitally and what I read printed. Uh, so I read daily news. I read rather. On, uh, online because I like it better and I don't have the bad feeling that I can't read everything. And then I think it's a good thing that you can also share within your family the, the subscription and stuff. And yet printed, I would, uh, would uh, just really look at the kiosk, what interests me. And that's more not on a regular basis, basis but um, what uh, triggers my, my vision. Yeah. Uh, the only subscription I have is to Stack, which is like a service that sends you a different indie magazine from all over the world every month. Uh, I really like that, um, more from the design perspective, not necessarily from the content you get there, but you get nice surprises. Um, uh, and that's the only uh, subscription I have, of course. I pick and choose uh, magazines, um, lots of stuff <laughs> lying around this table here I, um, I read. Regularly, I think I only read like uh, online newspapers um, like Tagesspiegel, um, Freitag, Zeit, and then some international ones, uh, Guardian, uh, sometimes New Yorker, New York Times. Um, but I don't check regularly, it just happens to come across my feed or so. Yeah. <laughs> so we can do the wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a subscription of Reportage. Unfortunately, yeah. they couldn't be with us today. So um, yeah, that one over there. Yeah. I really love it. It's long form um, journalism. Next to that, I'm a new, I well, not a news junkie, but I read the paper every morning digitally. <laughs> um, and finally, it's a Swiss newspaper. I just stuck with it because I uh, yeah, I've been here for many years, but you still read that one. Um, and no, not NZZ, but uh, the Tages Anzeiger. Okay. NZZ, I sometimes get first Monday of the month. I can really recommend it because that's when the folio is attached to it, which is a nice uh, magazine, um, yeah, a monthly magazine that always is after a topic. So that's what I read. And then, of course, all the other things. But 
there's one magazine, I really, I heard about it, I never remembered the name, and I'm not sure anymore if I made it up in my mind or if it really existed. <laughs> so it was a magazine that talks about things that happened three months ago. So kind of the concept was that only three months after you can cut through all the noise and get to the signal. So it's kind of a delayed news magazine. Yeah, it's called delayed verification. Is it called? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that will be my next uh, subscription. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love the yeah. concept there because I, I really, yeah. I needed cure. There's so much information and I'm interested in knowledge. So I, yeah. I follow all the things that kind of help me. With that. I mean, everything you can see on this table here was probably organized by me. <laughs> and I try for myself personally to um, try a new subscription every year. So I'll pick one magazine and say this will be my magazine subscription yeah. of the year yeah. and, and test it out. Um, mm. Yeah, but I've basically, yeah, anything that's lying on this table except the football magazine. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> not a station, I have a yeah. um, It's something that I would read. Yeah. I actually, I guess it's a mix of yours and mine. <laughs> yeah. It's a mix of everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, really interesting. I want to. I mean, I really enjoy <laughs> this panel. We get to talk a bit longer, but I really think it's the people that have been hanging out in front of a screen and didn't have the um, pleasure or privilege to be here in our uh, little workshop uh, discussion on site. I uh, want to release you after 90 minutes of screen time, but I do have one question that I really want to ask because, yeah, I take the thing to, to ask this last question uh, to around here, but there's so many people that want to start a magazine, start a publication in some way. And if, if maybe the three of you had one advice that you could give to people that want to, yeah, I don't know, create, found their own magazine, what would it be? What do they have to really look for to make it work? Be really innovative and yeah, find a good niche, I think. That would be mm -hmm. yeah, like um, referring also to what you said, Mm -hmm. Because I think there's already so much on the market. Um, uh, uh, um, looking at the content on the one side, but also then visually, graphically, you see so many different types of um, graphic design and yeah, how the layout goes. So I think it has to be really something new and interesting. <laughs> if you have an edge. Mm -hmm. Yes. First yeah. advice was the second one. Don't expect uh, to, to, to get rich. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I've, I'm really thankful that you show the numbers so honest. Yeah. And uh, I think that's one point. But the other point is let's uh, just start doing it. And even if it's just with a photo photocopy machine, um, because I'm still a fan of indie zines. And uh, I think there can't be enough of them. But I'm also. Um, I have the same feeling like you, it has to be special in a way, but start doing it. Yeah, I, I think there's a trend to more and more niche topics in magazines, and yeah, um, so there are still lots of niches left, I think. Uh, yeah, my, my advice would be um, don't be afraid. Um, um, only one of us has a, like a background in journalism and publishing, uh, all the others, like, just knew about new work or, or whatever topic you're interested in and uh, um, just need passion about that and um, yeah and when we started out I, lots of stuff we learned along um, uh, I just joined the team a, a year ago I was friends with them before but uh, so I didn't uh, participate in the starting phase but like you have to learn lots but uh, there's some room for error and um, uh, it worked out right, and uh, yeah, um, don't expect to get rich, of, of course, but uh, um, it can be a re really re rewarding um, experience, uh, and you can find lots of people um, flocking to you um, with the same interest, and I think that's also something worth, yeah. Okay, so I'm summarizing, um, find your edge. <laughs> Don't expect to get rich. <laughs> Just get started yeah. and don't yeah, be afraid. Yeah, don't be afraid. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's nice. Yeah, thank you so, so much. It was really, really interesting. Um, 
sorry that we didn't include any audience voices, but you haven't been like really. Yes, there was one about audio, but that's just going to open a whole new box of <laughs> discussions. So I'm, yeah. I would suggest we create a whole new product crunch topic order on audio. Audio, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll leave that um, for now. Also, like, if there are any questions, we are always happy about any questions we get. We try to uh, be as transparent as possible and also answer like uh, questions about uh, our background. Uh, stuff going on and just ask us um, my mail address uh, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, um, I, what's left to say is thank you so, so much uh, for joining everybody. We have some gift bags for you. I think they're in the other room, so you already got them. Um, but just so that everybody knows what's in there, um, we had um, each, uh, everybody's magazine, so you can read a bit <laughs> what, what you do. And we also made a donation to um, the Committee to Protect Journalism, or journalists, I don't know. I hope, uh, yeah, journalists or journalism. So we made a donation uh, for them uh, in your names. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, thanks so much for you for joining. It's Product Crunch wouldn't work without uh, the people um, willing to share their, their learnings, their ideas. Also, thanks to uh, Sophie, if she's still uh, joining in. She's probably at lunch right now. I <laughs> yeah. um, also have to thanks, uh, say thanks so much for um, organizing it. I mean, first of all, that uh, good, good Patch gives us the, the chance to invest time also at work to put all of this together to, to give back to the community, but then also to the people organizing it. So uh, Monica puts a lot in into putting the program together, but also Alex and Felix. And I'm just going to grab the gimbal now. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Yeah. yeah. So you see Alex there. He's hiding behind these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they've been doing a really nice. I haven't seen it if it worked out, to be honest. But I think you've done uh, a really nice job of of uh, kind of getting your conversation at the table out there in the digital realm. Um, yeah. And I think that's it. We earned our little aperitivo. Um, and thanks so much for joining. And I hope to have you with us for the next product crunch. Thank you.